Perspectives. On this episode, Matt gets back to training and providing his take on how to take accident scene photographs. Be sure to catch the latest issue of PI Magazine that features his article on 10 tips to make you a better and more efficient accident photography expert. Just one picture can tell a thousand words if you know how to frame your story. Let's check out the latest episode with our host, private investigator, Matt Spare. Hey everybody, welcome to the latest episode of PI Perspectives. I am your host, Matt Spare, a private investigator here in New York City. And today we are going to talk about accident scene photography. There are two different types. There's the motor vehicle accident scene photography and the uh, negligence slash construction site photography. We're going to talk a little bit about all these aspects today. Basically, I wanted to jump in and talk about doing training today as opposed to interviewing. We're going to get back to doing more interviewing in the next few weeks. But every now and then, I'd, I'd like to pop in and just give you tips on how to do certain things give you my perspective on how to do things better. This episode actually goes in conjunction with the latest issue of PI Magazine. Their November, December issue that just came out actually has all these tips and an article that I had written for them. So I'm giving you guys a sneak peek. I know the digital version is out and available, but the the full hard copy, I, I don't think has been shipped out yet. Maybe it has by the time you hear this. Definitely check out the article. Just to tell you a little bit about my background and kind of why I have the authority to talk about this stuff is uh, I've been doing this as an investigator specifically for personal injury cases for about 15 years. When I first started doing photography, I was actually uh, trained by a guy in New York who specialized in it. He's still in business now. He's about 35 years in business uh, specifically doing photography. I had just started my business. I was out there looking to get new clients and he had an issue with uh, with overflow work. He couldn't uh, handle all the work that was coming in. So we had a meeting one day and he said, listen, I'm going to train you how to do what I do. I'm going to show you some tricks and techniques and you know, I want you to do my overflow work. So I was definitely blessed in uh, having that good revenue stream in the beginning and it was, it was helpful. We're going to jump in now and talk about these 10 tips. Tip number one. Always try and arrive to the location of uh, your shoot about the same time of day and the same day of the week that your accident happened. So this is extremely important when you're doing motor vehicle accidents. When you get there the same time of day, lighting can be an issue. Sometimes uh, where the sun is in the sky is a factor. If you've got blind spots, it's something you want to be able to recognize and understand that it could have been a factor. In the case, I remember I had a uh, case I was working on in Yonkers, New York, where my client was actually representing a police officer who was responding to a call with his lights and sirens on. And as he entered the intersection, his motor vehicle, um, the police vehicle, was hit almost head on by a uh, a car that uh, was heading not in the opposite direction, but they had the, that car actually had the uh, the green light. My client's vehicle had stopped and then entered the intersection and was subsequently hit by this other vehicle. The reason I mention that is I was able to obtain video. And when I reviewed the video of the accident, I noticed that there was definitely some glare. Glare was an issue. So I went to the accident scene about the same time of day where the accident happened, same lighting conditions. And sure enough, there was definitely glare in the sky and uh, it was a factor in the accident in the, the person not being able to see the, the lights of the police car. Interestingly enough, the driver of the vehicle had actually testified that his, he had his radio on very loud and couldn't hear the sirens. So these were all factors in the accident. Something that we were able to figure out because we were there the same time of day where the accident happened. The same day of the week is also important too when you're uh, doing intersection cases. You're talking about lighting sequences. So when there's turn arrows and um, light patterns, if, you're, if the lights are programmed a certain way, it may be that uh, the sequence is different on different days. So it's just something to keep in the back of your mind. So listen, you're not always able to do things the same day of the week at the same time. Sometimes it's time sensitive and you got to get out there and do what you need to do. But given the choice, if you can get out there when the accident happened, it's definitely helpful. 
again, same thing, lighting issues on the negligence cases too, just seeing if lighting was a factor. You know, if an accident happened at night and it's a trip and fall case, you want to get an idea of what the lighting looks like. So going out and shooting the scene using uh, basically what the human eye would see. So you don't want to use any filters or anything like that. You want to be able to show exactly what the human eye sees at that time of night, uh, showing how dark things were. So that is tip number one. Tip number two, do not show up and point and shoot. Worst thing you can do. When you go to an accident site, leave your camera in the car or if you're using your cell phone, put it in your pocket and don't even attempt to take any photos, right? What you want to do is you want to really just soak up the scene. You want to understand all the possible factors, things that could have happened, what could have caused the accident. You're really understanding and making a game plan of how you want to tell your story. It's a lot easier to do if you don't have your, your phone in your hand or your, or your camera in your hand because um, it makes you think and take your time and really understand how to recreate. So the worst thing you can do is is rush, right? Think about this. I think about the, uh, the Sherlock uh, BBC version or even the Robert Downey Jr. version where Sherlock's recreating uh, how an accident happened in his head. He's walk, walking through this scenario and you're seeing how things are unfolding, right? That's a good technique to use, right? So just take your time and try and understand how an accident happened before you try and capture photos. The whole idea is you want your photos to tell a story and you want it to make sense. Even the order in which you take your pictures is really important. Following a format is the way you want to do things. So tip number three. Coming up, Matt will have more tips. But first, we're going to tell you about Scope Now. ScopeNow.com. We automate your social media investigations. Not a Scope Now user? Visit them at ScopeNow.com slash try. ScopeNow.com slash try. Make sure to visit the website to learn all about the new exciting upgrades of Scope Now 3.0. Scopenow.com. S-K-O-P-E-N-O-W.com. Don't forget to mention code PIP19 when you visit the site and sign up for an account to receive a 10% discount. That's PIP19. Tip number three is for motor vehicle accidents, it's following a format that makes sense, right? So you always want to start with your client's progression. So I do a lot of plaintiff work. So I would start my progression shots uh, showing the, the progression of a plaintiff leading up to uh, where the accident happened, right? So if it's an intersection case, I take four or five shots going into uh, the intersection showing how my client was traveling. The next set of shots would be uh, the defendant's progression. So showing how they were entering the intersection, showing if there was anything that was obstructing any views, any trees that might have been hanging or signs that may be in the way always things you want to look for. The next couple of shots would be a 360 degree view of the intersection. So basically what that means is going to each corner and taking two or three shots to show what it would look like from each vantage point. So the next couple of shots I would take would be witness vantage points. If there are witnesses to the accident and you were able to interview them beforehand, ask them where they were standing or where they were driving and Take some photos that show their vantage point. Really important later on for depositions, giving your client the ability to have a photo to show a witness to have them ID and say it's a fair and accurate representation is helpful. The next thing you want to do is you want to look for any video cameras, right? Which is also another reason why you don't want to rush when you get uh, to an accident site because you want to look and see if there are any cameras around. And you want to take photos from their vantage point to show what angles, what angles they're facing, any identification numbers on those video cameras are also important. Finding all that information and being able to uh, document it in a way that just makes sense is really, really important. And the other thing to remember is, uh, you know, you don't want to take like 100 or 200 photos when you go out to a site, right? Typically, 35 to 40 photos on this type of assignment is really all that you need. Uh, anything more than that, you start repeating and you just want to stay as focused as possible. That is tip number three. Tip number four is the premises case format. So again, you've got your plaintiff progression, three, four, five shots showing how the person who got injured, the direction they were walking, traveling in before they had their accident, right? Next thing you want to do is you want to take a 360 degree view of the area 
So again, you're taking photos from all sides. And again, it wouldn't take more than like two or three photos from, from each side as you're doing all, all four sides. And the other thing you want to do is you want to make sure in those 360 degree photos that you're showing like the full surrounding. If there's a building that uh, your defect is next to, you want to make sure that you take photos of the whole building, right? You want to show what type of building that is, were there any commercial units in it? Does it look to be like a multifamily home, single family residence? These are all important as far as liability goes and who's responsible. The next few shots are of the defect. So when you're taking photos of a defect, you want to make sure that you're obviously taking photos with measurements, but I would suggest taking the same exact photos without measurements. This is important because sometimes a good attorney will question whether or not the ruler that you're using is a correct ruler, right? So they make the argument like, I, I haven't had the opportunity to examine this ruler, so I don't know if it's accurate. So therefore, I'm going to move to exclude any photos that have rulers in them because I don't have the ability to examine the ruler. And sometimes the judge may rule in their favor. So it's important to take the same exact shots at the same exact angles, both with a ruler and without a ruler. Really, really important. The next thing you want to do is you want to take any photos from the vantage points of witnesses. So again, if you have an eyewitness, somebody you interviewed, you know where they were standing or uh, where they were located when an accident happened, you have the ability to show if they were obstructed in any way or if there were any issues. The next thing you want to look for is you want to look for video cameras. You want to see if there are any uh, cameras in the area that may have captured your accident and uh, you want to take photos of them showing, you know, the angles that they would have uh, captured. But you also want to look for any identifying uh, numbers on the camera so you can make the appropriate requests uh, to gather that information. The other thing I recommend is, you know, obviously when you're measuring a defect to take measurements of the length, the width and the depth of uh, the, the defect or the step. If it is a step, you want to measure the full step width, the length, and the rise of the step, right? You also want to measure the full set of steps and railings for any possible code violations. So sometimes you're looking at a stairway and uh, there could be issues with the stairs. You may not know what those issues are, but if you capture that information and they, get, they give that information over to the engineer, it'll uh, let them know and point them in the right direction. And again, taking photos of these same defects without the uh, ruler measurements is important. So also you want to look for any uh, manholes, sewer, or gas covers, any patchwork uh, that is adjacent to your defect that will help you identify it. So like for instance, there are big metal plates sometimes that are put on top of construction sites. Those plates have ID numbers welded into them. So you want to be able to capture that in your photos for identification purposes. Another trick that you can do is you can try and shoot some video. So I had a case that I worked on where it was a defective step. And uh, the adjuster uh, had come back to my client and said, well, I, I don't think this step is, is broken. Show me that it, it, it moves. I don't think it moves. Well, I had the, uh, the foresight to actually take a video showing that the, um, the step was broken and just you know, pressing my foot down on it, showing that there was give and take in it and uh, that you could lift it up. And if you stepped down in a certain way, it, it uh, sunk in and, and created a tripping hazard. Uh, because I took that video, the client was able to settle the case without having to litigate it. Uh, because I was essentially able to prove his case uh, beyond any kind of argument. That is tip number four. We're going to jump into tip number five, and we're halfway done here. So tip number five, use Google Images for historical research on defect cases. You can actually go into Google uh, and find current photos. If you do the street view, you can find your defect, and then there's a way to toggle through and look for older photographs. So this is important when you're trying to establish how long a defective condition um, has been at a particular site, right? So Google has mapped all these areas out 
uh, especially if you're in a, a major city in, like New York, like me, there's a lot of information available and really understanding how to toggle the mouse and uh, find different years. Uh, if you're having some issues, if you move the cursor on the mouse like to the right or to the left, sometimes you can find additional images. So there's really an art to it. you got to take your time and uh, uh, going through the area and, and uh, surfing through different uh, locations to find different images is also helpful. These images go back as far as 2007 in some cities, so you'll uh, have to go investigate and take a look on your own. Uh, the newer images tend to have better resolution, so the older you get, the more poor quality the photos are going to be. But um, you know, you're always able to uh, to at least see what it looked like at that time. So, you know, sometimes you find patches that are done, right? So there's a defect, and then you look and you show that there was uh, some repair work done, and then you take another look and you show that that repair work failed. These are all things that are important when you're foiling, requesting information or when you're just trying to establish uh, liability, really, really important. So I also recommend doing an overhead satellite image just for context. It's always um, helpful, uh, especially if it's a, a defect case where you're naming a, a municipality, you know, having a, an overhead shot and having a tax map shot, probably a good idea as well. Let's jump into tip number six. So I kind of gave away this a little bit earlier, but I'm going to cover it again because it is tip number six. Letting your photos tell a story. This is a really, really important thing to do. So imagine that you're uh, serving jury duty and you've got a case that was just presented to you and you wanted to review the evidence. Sometimes you're just going to ask for the photos. Sometimes you're going to ask for the photos and the reports. Sometimes they're going to give you everything and and you have the ability to pick and choose what you want to look at. You got to realize that sometimes somebody will be looking at a photo and they won't know exactly what they're looking at, right? There, there won't be a narrative to go along with it. So it's really important that you let that photo tell a story, especially if it's a progression of photos, right? So sticking with that photo progression and telling a story is really important. You want to frame it. I think the guys and the girls that are really good at doing photography are able to, to follow this format, right? Tell a story without having any words attached to it, right? Uh, you want to have your client be able to take a look at that photo and understand exactly what they're looking at and the context of that photo in relation to the accident. Really important. I think a lot of times that I get called in to uh, take additional photos that maybe some other investigators have, have taken, um, that's the number one reason. Or, you know, you have a client that, uh, you know, someone who's injured, they go out and they take their own photos. The client will send me their photos and, and they're good to help me kind of try and ID where an accident took place. But having that, um, that context really helps to tell a story. And that's really what you want to do with your photos. You want to tell a story. Next tip, tip number seven, using Dropbox or Google Drive to distribute your photos. This is a game changer. If you do not use Dropbox or Google Drive, you need to start using Dropbox or Google Drive. So what you're able to do is you're able to upload the images without compressing it. If you send your photos via email, um, they get zipped together in a file folder and um, you're not getting the same quality out of your photos. Why is this important? Well, it's important if your client wants to take these images and now blow them up for trial to big exhibits, right? If they don't have the full actual file, it's not going to look as good. And it may not show exactly what you're looking for, right? I prefer using Dropbox. It's just easier for me. I think most clients actually understand how to use Dropbox as opposed to Google Drive. I have used both in the past. Uh, I tend to find that when I'm using Google Drive, I get the phone calls from my attorney client saying, Danny in the mailroom can't figure out how to uh, take the images off of Google Drive. Can you just send me a zip card? Which is another thing you can do too, right? So you can take your images and put them onto a thumb drive and mail them off to your client. That's definitely another option, but I wouldn't recommend that because it just takes so much longer and uh, those, those cards get lost. And when they're lost, they're gone forever, right? Having something on Dropbox or Google Drive is the way to go. Having that, that uncompressed file is important and uh, obviously not losing the file is 
optimal as well. I know there's some out there that uh, print up photos and then they label photos and then they send them off to clients. I don't know. To me, that's just busy work. Yeah, you can make a few extra bucks off doing it. But to me, I like to be as efficient as possible with my time and um, labeling Photographs is, in my opinion, not being efficient with uh, with my time or my staff's time. I just assume reference it in the report and let somebody else do it. Um, sometimes they don't even want the photos printed. They're just emailing them to an adjuster anyways. Going the electronic route, in my opinion, is the way to go. So that's tip number seven. Let's move on to tip number eight. The rest of Matt's tips coming up, but first... This episode is brought to you by Satellite Investigations in New York City. Satellite Investigations is New York's leading investigation firm since 2005. Check out the newsletter archives for previous articles and publications. Matt is also available to be booked as a speaker for your association or conference events. You can visit their site at SatellitePI.com, S-A-T-E-L-L-I-T-E-P-I.com for more details. Photograph tip number eight, do not modify or enhance any photo other than changing the name of the file folder initially. Why is this important? Well, there are times that you're giving a deposition or you're testifying in court and the attorney who's um, cross-examining you, asking you questions, um, they'll ask you, did you manipulate this photo in any way? Did you enhance it? Did you use any type of filter? Is it a fair and accurate representation of what the defect looked like on the day of the accident? So if you can't answer that question affirmatively that you didn't do anything to manipulate that photo, you're creating the specter that an image may have been manipulated. And there's a chance, maybe a small chance, but there's a chance that that particular image can be thrown out of the proceedings because it had been edited in some way. I get it, and I understand that sometimes you have to enhance things. Sometimes it's too dark. Sometimes it's um, the best way to get around this issue is to just address it in your report. Yes, I had to use this filter. or Yes, I had to boost up the contrast on this uh, so you're able to take a look at the defect better. So I think by addressing it up front, you um, take the sales out of the argument that um, the photo was manipulated with. So don't ever modify or enhance a photo unless you absolutely have to. So that's tip eight. Tip nine, explore other technology to incorporate into your photos, right? So an example of this would be like a light meter. There are sometimes we work on cases where the whole causation or or, um, cause of action may be the lighting Uh, at a particular area, right? Someone fell down a set of stairs because it was too dark. There's equipment out there that you can actually use to read how well the area is lit, right? So that's referred to as lumens. So you go and uh, you take a light meter and it'll tell you basically how many lumens are being generated in an area. What you would do is you want to check your local codes commercial space codes uh, with regards to lighting and see what the bare minimum is. And you can go in there and uh, take some readings. So the way you want to approach that, it's it's a great opportunity to upsell. Uh, just one more service that you're able to offer uh, on these types of cases. So it's more than just photos and videos. Now you're doing photos, videos, and you're able to do a light meter reading as well. I suggest you go out there and get one and uh, keep it in your arsenal just in case you ever have those types of cases. It's a way to do a more thorough investigation and really add credibility to your client's argument that the space was too dark and that was part of the reason that the accident took place. So these are good on stairway cases or you know restaurant slipper trip fall cases where uh, lighting could be an issue. All right, here we go. Tip number 10. Take your time and practice, practice, practice. And when you're done, go practice some more. Go out and find defects out in the street and just take photos of them. Practice shooting in your free time and really understand your equipment. If you're using an SLR, understand how to take it off automatic and use it in manual mode. Play around with it. Understand by hitting certain buttons or doing different functions how you're able to use your equipment to the best of its ability of what you're trying to do. 
uh, really understand the limitations of the equipment that you're using. That's important. Which leads me to bonus tip 11. Let the equipment you use be dictated by the type of assignment. So there are, are times where we'll need to do uh, covert photography. Maybe you're using your cell phone. Maybe you're using a, a, a key fob, which is a great piece of equipment, by the way, available at the uh, PI Gear. It looks like a little uh, automobile key car starter or, or um, opener or closer, but it's actually a video camera. That Bluetooth to your phone, great piece of equipment. I strongly recommend it if uh, for those type of assignments. But really like letting the facts of the accident, what you're trying to capture, let that dictate the type of uh, equipment you're using, right? So we're always going to defer or prefer to use our cell phones. Just it's easier. We can go and put everything up in Dropbox nice and easy. We don't have to download it and then transfer like I get it. But sometimes it's better to use a regular SLR camera. Sometimes you need video that's involved. So making sure that whatever device you're using to capture photos, you have the ability to capture video as well. So I'm going to give you bonus tip number 12. That's right, folks. I'm giving you two extra tips. The extra tip here is um, always making sure that you're time sensitive with your photography assignments. When a client calls you or they send you an email and they want you to go out and take photos, especially on defect cases, actually on car accident cases too. So on defect cases, getting out there in a timely fashion, you obviously want to get out there before a defect is repaired, right? If you take too long and you've got it sitting in your work folder for a couple of weeks and by the time you get around to it, you know, they've already gone out and repaired a defect. Well, you've got an issue now. You weren't doing your due diligence as quickly as you should have. The other thing is video camera. So if you're going out to do a site inspection and you come across a video camera and you got the assignment at like day 20 and by the time you got out there, it's day 40 and the video camera expires at day 30, well, that's an issue for you, right? So the same thing goes for car accident cases, right? You go out to a car accident location, you find uh, video cameras all over the place. If uh, you're more than 30 days, there's a good chance that the video that could have been there and could have been useful is no longer there because it only lasts for 30 days. That is bonus tip number two, giving you 12 lovely tips on how to take better photos and how to be more efficient when taking accident scene photos. That's pretty much it. I'm going to wrap up here. I appreciate you guys tuning in and checking out this episode. Yeah, and I just uh, want to say thank you to, to the feedback that I'm getting on these episodes. It's encouraging to see that uh, so many people have found the information to be useful and um, they've enjoyed the guests and uh, found them to be um, knowledgeable in certain uh, areas and topics. And really, that's the spirit of what we're doing here and what we're going to continue to do. We want to train you guys. We want to either teach you how to do something or introduce you to somebody who's really good at doing something and uh, give you a contact on how to get a hold of them. Thank you again. Appreciate you guys taking the time and we will talk to you soon. Thanks for downloading this episode. Now grab your cameras and get out there and practice. We sincerely thank all of you for the continued support and positive feedback. We can't wait to announce our lineup of guests in the near future. Don't forget to look for Matt's article in the latest issue of PI Magazine. And please be sure to rate us five stars at Apple Podcasts, leave us a comment or review, and share this episode with a friend. On the next episode, we welcome Brianne Joseph from Sly Fox Investigations in New Orleans. Check out her perspective on social media marketing for private investigators. Now on behalf of Matt Spare, thanks for downloading and subscribing to PI Perspectives.